let's continue talking about the social self, but this time let's talk about self-presentation. You'll be able to identify with self-presentation pretty well because most of us engage in self-presentation. What we're trying to do is actively shape the way that other people think about us. And this happens all the time. It, it could be in polite conversation. It could be during a political ad. We want others to think a particular way about who we are. We might be trying to gain some influence. Maybe we're trying to gain sympathy. Maybe we want to gain their approval. There could be a variety of motives for our self-presentation concerns, but many of us are actively trying to get people to think a particular way about who we are. Let's talk about some of those motives. Strategic self-presentation is motivated by two primary things. One thing is by self-ingratiation. And what I mean by that is we often just want to get along with people. We want to be more liked by those people. And therefore, we might act in a way to curry their favor. So, of course, we tend to like people who agree with us about things. So someone might be talking to me and I'll be shaking my head and smiling and nodding. And um, the other person's going to think that I'm agreeing with them and they're going to be more likely to like me. Um, I might start asking them questions. Uh, I, I might start telling them how I'm interested in the things that they're interested in. The bottom line is I might present myself in such a way that they're more likely to like me. I also could be motivated by just simple self-promotion. So I might want to get ahead. I, I might want to gain their respect. I might be trying to uh, develop a position of power and influence over people. Uh, Think about politicians, for example. They're going to boast about their status and all the things that they've done and how powerful they are and how they'd be able to run our country in a way that's going to be so productive. The bottom line is they are trying to promote themselves such that we would think that they would be a good leader. And of course, we do this you know, in a variety of other situations. Think about a guy who's uh, going after a girl. And there are, there are many different ways, of course, that people might try to make themselves look better. But one way someone might make themselves look better is by uh, looking stronger or more respected in the community or uh, as a strong business leader or as someone who's really smart. Uh, oftentimes we say we're just trying to put our best foot forward, um, but sometimes it's our best foot and sometimes it's kind of a, a, an act, really, of who we are. So now that all depends. You know, some of us engage in self-presentation more than others. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Self-presentation, as I'm sure you're thinking, really is best when it's subtle. Because if people come on too strong, it really can backfire. Let's talk about a couple of those examples. Think about it at work. In this example, this guy is clearly a brown noser. And uh, we've all seen that type of thing. We can see that if somebody's really trying to ingratiate themselves... Uh, really trying to suck up to the boss. The rest of us can see through that. We don't see it as authentic and we resent it. In other words, it backfires. I'm sure you've been in this situation too. You might have a friend and the friend's always talking about himself and he's so great. And and at some point you're just thinking to yourself like, you know, uh, you're always making yourself out to be a hero. I'm getting kind of tired of that. So again, we get a little tired sometimes of people when they go overboard with their self-presentation techniques. This is a great quote. Who knows himself a braggart, let him fear this, for it will come to pass that every braggart shall be found an ass. And I'm sure we can all think of situations where that's the case. Let's talk about self-verification. It's, it's a related concept and it's really pretty interesting. The bottom line is we do try to present ourselves in a particular way so that other people will think of us in a particular way, and it's usually positive. But we often want people to perceive us as we perceive ourselves. In other words, we want them to be accurate in how they perceive us. Um, I mean, we don't always have much control over the world, but we at least want other people to see us as we believe we are. So in general, you know, people might selectively uh, elicit information from others or recall information about themselves uh, or simply accept personality feedback from other people that confirms their self-conceptions. Uh, let me give you some examples of that to, to make that more clear. Uh, I'm sure you've all been in a situation where you've corrected somebody regarding something that they were saying about you that was inaccurate. You were just trying to set the record straight. 
you know, like so for example, I remember at one point um, my grandmother talking about me to one of her friends and she was talking about how I'm a doctor. And I, I knew that the other person was thinking this about me, that I was some type of physician. And at some point, once there was a break in the conversation, I had to make it clear, you know, yeah, I, I do have a doctorate, but I'm not a physician. I'm a college professor. And, and now the person probably had something very different in their mind about who I was. Now, for people that think I'm a physician, they're probably going to think of me as in a way that might be better than I really am, at least the way the world perceives physicians. Um, but you see how it's interesting. I wanted to set the record straight. I, I didn't want there to be this min misinformation out there, even though it was positive. So I was trying to make sure that this person um, really understood what was going on about me. I want to verify the important information about myself. And that kind of does bring up an interesting point that we notice self-verification types of motives, even when someone's self-concept is somewhat negative. This little comic does a good job of demonstrating that point. You see the little female pig saying, um, I really hope he just says yes. You know, I mean, we're all pigs after all. And then she asks, honey, uh, do you think I look fat? And he's thinking like, uh, oh, well, um, and he's thinking this is a trick. And the whole point is she's like, yeah, I'm fat. I'm a pig. You can tell me I'm fat. I know I'm fat. I want you to recognize who I am. So in their case, it's not necessarily a negative thing. But the bottom line is, even when we do have some type of trait, um, we want other people to notice that trait, even when it's not positive, even when it is negative. Let me give you a quick personal example of that. I remember at some point I was just talking to my stepmom. It was just, it was just she and I discussing something, and she was talking about how I'm outgoing. And again, once there was a break in the conversation, I just had, kind of had to clarify. I'm like, you know, I'm not... I'm not really as outgoing as you're saying I am. I'd much rather blend in than be the person who stands out. And uh, outgoing is a good thing, but I, I kind of wanted to make sure she understood I'm not that outgoing simply because I wanted to set the record straight. I simply wanted to make it clear who I really was. So you see, the whole point in this is that we do have a motive to be authentic. Um, we want to be true to our personality. Now, it's kind of neat, too. There's some other interesting research to show that um, people look for partners, you know, like in relationships and friends uh, with people who do understand those negative traits. So, for example, there's been some research to show that people who have positive self-concepts, they're more committed to partners who see them positively. But people who have relatively negative self-concepts, they tend to be more committed to partners who see those negative characteristics in them. And that's kind of strange. I think it's not something that we would typically predict. All right, let's wrap up this conversation by talking about self-monitoring. Here's the bottom line. Not everybody worries so much about how other people see them. Some people are more likely than others to engage in the self-presentation that we've been talking about. Well, how can we classify people as people who engage in strategic self-presentation more than others? One way to do that is in terms of what we call being a, a high or a low self-monitor. High self-monitors are essentially social chameleons. And this is what I mean by that. Chameleons, of course, are very good at blending in with their environment. So if the environment dictates that they be relatively light-colored, they're going to be relatively light-colored. If the environment dictates that they be relatively dark green color, they're going to be a relatively dark green color. They're looking to the environment to see how to blend in because, of course, that's going to be adaptive to them. Well, high self-monitors, when it comes to human beings, are somewhat similar. They're going to look at the social situation. If the social situation dictates that they be gregarious and outgoing, they're going to be gregarious and outgoing. If the social situation... Uh, dictates that they be a little bit more reserved and laid back, they're going to be more reserved and laid back. The bottom line is they're relatively good actors, and they're also good at reading other people. They want to act in a way that you will accept for that situation. In other words, they have a really flexible public self-identity. They don't have a problem with acting differently from situation to situation. One example from the media that's really good at showing this point is Dexter. Dexter, of course, was a sociopath, um, but he was also a high self-monitor. 
And that's because he didn't really understand about normal human behavior. So if he wanted to blend in with the world, he had to study people really well and figure out how you should act in a particular situation. And he had no qualms about just simply acting. Uh, if he was supposed to be happy because he had a baby, he would be happy because he had a baby, even though he didn't necessarily truly feel those types of emotions. Uh, if he was supposed to be angry and upset, he'd be angry and upset because he can tell that's what the social situation was supposed to dictate for him. Now, low self-monitors, on the other hand, are self-verifiers by nature. So remember, self-verifiers are people who want you to think very accurately about who they are. So they're not very comfortable with acting. That's why I say they're good character actors, because you have probably seen in different TV shows what we call character actors. That is, they might play like a mob boss in many different situations, and it's because for whatever reason, they just seem to really fit the mold of a mob boss. Well, we fit our mode very well, our mold very well. If I'm going to be an actor, the person who I'm going to play best is me. And I am a low self-monitor. And the bottom line is, as I go around from situation to situation or scene to scene in the real world, I'm playing myself. And I'm very consistent across situations. So I'm not looking necessarily to see what other people want from me. I'm just giving you who I am. So in that sense, low self-monitors are somewhat more authentic. I'm not trying to put a, a value judgment on it. I'm just trying to help you understand how high and low self-monitors might express themselves strategically in society. So here's another good example uh, from the show Dexter. We know that Dexter was a, sci uh, a high self-monitor. And in this situation, he's looking at his colleague and he's thinking, what does he want me to say? How can I get out of this situation and make him happy? But this was Sergeant Dokes, and Dokes, his main job, his main mission in life was to figure out what Dexter was up to. And it didn't matter what situation Dokes was in, Dokes was always going to act the same way because he was very authentic that way. He was a low self-monitor. If at some point someone described him as a nice guy, Dokes would go out of his way to tell you, no, I am not a nice guy. I'm going to do my job, and I don't care if you're going to be happy with me or not. That's a classic low self-monitor. So I'm just trying to help you understand the difference between those two. All right, that's it for right now. So uh, stay tuned, though, because there's more social psychology coming up soon.